Hello, I'm Anna Ray Mondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridge Hill, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. I am so excited to welcome my guest today, Dr. Eben Alexander. Welcome. Dr. Uh, Alexander uh, spent over 25 years as an academic neurosurgeon. In 2008, he became ill and went into a coma during which he underwent a near-death experience. He has shared his experience in, in his books, Proof of Heaven, Living in a Mindful Universe, which he co-authored with Karen Newell, and A Map of Heaven. Since his NDE, Dr. Alexander has dedicated himself to sharing information about near-death experiences and other spiritually transform transformative experience and what they teach us about consciousness and the nature of reality. He continues to promote further research on the unifying elements of science and spirituality, and together with Karen Newell, regularly teaches other ways to tap into our greater mind and the power of the heart to facilitate enhancement of healing relationships, creativity, guidance, and more. So welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. I can't imagine that anyone has not read your, your book. Um, because it's so, it, to me, it's just wonderful that you came out and wrote this book because you carry um, the credibility of a medical doctor. Can you briefly describe your NDE, please? Yes, well, important to point out that um, I'd spent the first 54 years of my life uh, following this uh, kind of conventional scientific view. I taught uh, neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School, thought I understood how brain, mind, and consciousness work. Uh, and then my NDE happened and showed me I didn't know anything. In fact, a lot of what I did think I knew was backwards from the reality. And this is uh, something that, uh, you know, people who have read Proof of Heaven will appreciate, but especially uh, if you look at the case, medical case report on my medical records that came out in September 2018 in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases, uh, it'll, po it'll paint a picture that uh, is very much as I portrayed in the, the book Proof of Heaven, which is that uh, given all that we attribute to the neuro neocortex uh, in, in manufacturing consciousness, we now realize given the nature of my illness and similar cases, where my neocortex was totally inactivated, that in fact, uh, that's where we get into the deep lessons about the brain and its relationship to consciousness. So getting right to your question, uh, uh, what happened to me during that week in coma back in November of, of 2008? Uh, I woke up with severe back pain, severe headaches, and went into grand mal seizures. Uh, my family was very alarmed by this. And from that moment forward, I was in deep coma for the next seven days. Uh, the EMTs came to our house, could not stop the seizures, took me off to the Lynchburg General Hospital emergency room. And uh, that's where uh, I was diagnosed with severe uh, gram-negative bacterial meningoencephalitis, put on a ventilator on three powerful antibiotics, put upon the medical ICU. And the thing about the medical case report that's so important is it documents the damage to my neocortex that should have obliterated any kind of dream hallucination hallucination or drug effect, because those would have required some part of my neocortex to be working, yet none of it was. That's why the scientific community takes this story so seriously. Uh, and what I do remember of those events, important to point out, first of all, that uh, kind of atypical of, of near-death experiences, I had no memory of Evan Alexander's life. Uh, no, no words, no language. Uh, so I really started this journey with an empty slate. Uh, and it started in what I call the earthworm's eye view, very primitive course on responsive realm. It was like being in dirty jello. I have strong memories of kind of roots and blood vessels all around me. The good news is that didn't last forever. I was in fact rescued from that by this slowly spinning white light that came packaged with a perfect musical melody. And that white light is what opened up the, uh, uh, into a portal, into higher and higher levels. And so I left that earthworm eye view ascending through this uh, portal of music and light up into an ultra real gateway valley. Um, and that had many earth-like features. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. There were millions of other butterflies. Uh, the colors and the uh, description of this realm was far richer than anything I'd ever experienced in my life. I remember uh, crystal 
uh, blue pools with sparkling waterfalls going into them. And there were millions of other butterflies all looping in these vast spiraling formations. Uh, down below us was this incredibly beautiful fertile meadow that was filled lush with life. Uh, no sign of any death or decay, blossoms, buds, flowers, all of this blooming and opening in this dynamic richness of pure uh, life. Uh, I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous beyond any kind of description. And beside me on this butterfly wing was a beautiful young woman, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones, uh, broad smile, a high forehead and soft brown hair framing her lovely face. She never said a word to me. She never had to. Her emotional truth and her deep message of assurance came into me. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You will be taken care of. And I cannot tell you how reassuring and refreshing that message was uh, in that realm. And uh, that's when I was also witnessing that there were thousands of beings down dancing in this meadow below us. Lots of joy and merriment and children playing and dogs jumping, incredible festivities and all of it being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs of pure, uh, pure beings, pure spiritual beings who were emanating chants and anthems and hymns that would just thunder through my awareness uh, and uh, this uh, incredible sense of the divine in that realm. To me, uh, the way I first reported it, that sense of the divine was a, a knowing of this uh, soft summer breeze that blew through and it was like the breath of God or this uh, divine wind as I called it in my early writings. Uh, and that was all in that gateway valley um, and yet the uh, angelic choirs above, that's what I call those swooping orbs of pure spiritual beings that were uh, emanating chants and anthems and hymns that were thundering through me and powering all this incredible festivity. And all of that resulted in my ascending to higher and higher levels. Uh, I remember seeing all four dimensional space time and the physical realm collapsing down. Then all of spiritual reality of that gateway valley and uh, a different ordering of causality that I call deep time, all of that collapsing down, all the way out to this uh, kind of sanctum sanctorum of the divine, the core realm, which was infinite inky blackness, but filled to overflowing with the divine infinite healing power of that, uh, that God force that is so healing that so many near-death experiencers for thousands of years across all belief systems have encountered and come back with that comfort to realize there's nothing to fear about the death of the body because it's not the end of our soul and of our soul's relationships with others. And so I would cycle through these multiple realms and many times I tell that whole story uh, in Proof of Heaven and expand on that story in our latest book, Living in a Mindful Universe. But there came a time when just as I was assured the first time I entered that core, you are not here to stay, you'll be going back. Uh, and there came a time when I could no longer conjure up uh, using the musical notes that originally had ushered me up into that gateway valley. Uh, they no longer worked. And uh, so at that point in the journey, uh, I realized I no longer had access to those higher spiritual realms, but I was beautifully surprised because even in the lowest murky realms of that uh, kind of earthworm eye view, I was welcomed back to wherever this realm was that I was headed by thousands of beings going off around me in these arcs into the distance with their heads bowed and this murmuring energy coming from them. And what I called all that in my early writings when I came back to this world was the power of prayer. I realized that all those beings going around were welcoming me to this, this uh, realm that I still had no idea what it was because I had no memories of the, of the earthly realm or of these lower spiritual realms. Uh, but I was very assured and knew now that I could trust and that that beautiful feeling of, of the prayer energy of those welcoming me back was part of that process. And it was at that point that I saw the six faces that appeared at the very end of my journey. They served as veridical time anchors that helped to prove that the vast majority of my spiritual journey happened between days one and five of my seven day coma. Uh, and uh, that was very crucial months later in trying to make sense of all this and show how it fit into the reality in this earthly realm. Um, but it was at that point in seeing those six faces uh, and the last of them was the face of a 10 year old boy. Even though I didn't recognize him at the time, it was my son Bond. That was that Sunday morning, day seven of coma, when the doctors had held a conference with a family saying that I'd gone from a 10% chance of survival early in the week down to a 2% chance of survival. And now after a week in coma due to the severe meningoencephalitis, 
no real chance of recovery. And that's why uh, they recommended stopping the antibiotics and letting me die. And when Bond heard that, he knew it was horrible news. They protected him from the worst news during this week. So he came running down the hallway into the ICU room where I was on the ventilator, held open my eyelids, and he was pleading with me, Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Well, I promise you I did not hear him with my ears or see him with my eyes. But deep in these spiritual realms where my soul was at that moment, uh, you know, in the process of leaving this physical world once and for all, I was aware of his presence and all of a sudden realized that all this did matter. So far, I had thought, well, this can continue or not. It doesn't matter. And now with his pleading with me to return, that's when I realized this all did matter. And I had a responsibility to another soul. I had no idea what a son would be or that this was my son, but I knew this very uh, strong connection to Bond and his pleading with me meant that I had to follow the lead and come back to this world. And that's when I did come back to this world. But important to point out to the listeners that when I did, my brain was so savaged by this illness that um, I didn't even recognize loved ones at the bedside, like my uh, former spouse, my mother, my sons, uh, my sisters. I had no idea who these beings were. And in fact, my personal memories, my language came back over hours and days, personal childhood memories over the next days and a week or so. And all of my knowledge of neuroscience and all of my memories of life before coma came back over about two months. Uh, we go into all that in the third book in Living in a Mindful Universe about this profound mystery that consciousness is not even created in the brain and that in fact, memories are not stored in the brain. That is something that we address in that book because it's the attempt to unite science and spirituality based on my experience and on the modern science of consciousness. I work with uh, scientists around the world who study consciousness. So this is all about uh, now the 12 years since my coma, trying to make sense of it and explain it. And what I can tell you is the good news is that the scientific community is hot on the trail of explaining how not only things like the afterlife are absolutely real, but that in fact, there's tremendous evidence for concepts such as reincarnation based on the scientific data. So our theater of operation for understanding brain, mind, and consciousness is far grander uh, than it has been in the past. And that's where I think my journey uh, opens the scientific world and the medical world to the reality of these stories. But of course, there are millions of NDE stories and after death communications, et cetera, out there that we need to make sense of in expanding our view of the nature of reality. You know, I think it's amazing that you remember that in so much detail. It's like it was printed on your soul. You know, I wrote a book called Conversations with Mary. And one of the questions I asked her was specifically about you. You know, why did this man, you know, receive this, you know, was able to go through this near-death experience? And her, her answer to me was because it's more and more people in the medical field because we validate that. Because if you say that, then, you know, there's a validation to it. And it's about the marriage of science and spirituality that has to come through the mouths of, of doctors and scientists and right. people like you. So do you feel that's true? I feel that, that in many ways that is true. I mean, people often ask me, were you chosen for this? Well, I would say that all of us are chosen for the myriad different roles we play in this awakening of humanity. I know that Karen and I, my uh, life partner and the co-author of that third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, we give talks around the world and they're all based in awakening in people's uh, own awareness, the power they have as a soul, as an eternal spiritual being to come into this higher knowledge. Uh, I think that NDEs are always tailored to the individual. First and foremost, that's why the NDE exists, is to help that individual go through some growth. And it turns out that every now and then, uh, a soul's uh, pattern of growth is something that is also of interest to the world at large. And I would say, certainly as a neuroscientist going through this deep encounter with a severe uh, bacterial meningoencephalitis that absolutely should have killed me, uh, and yet surviving it and then making an absolutely miraculous recovery. Um, yes, that is all part of the bigger message for humanity. But I would add that near-death experiences and after-death communications and past life memories in children, all of these stories by the thousands, by the millions, 
are what this world needs to grow up with because they are part of our fundamental underlying reality. People for a long time have thought that science invalidates near-death experiences, but no, modern quantum informed science studying consciousness absolutely is coming together in a way that fully supports the reality uh, of these journeys and of the, this nature of human spirit. And it's especially important because for all of us, all of us folks out here trying to make our way through the world, the power to heal and to come into wholeness is within our grasp. That's one of the deepest and most profound lessons of the NDE community. Uh, and it's certainly the medical community as it wakes up to this, realizes that placebo effect, which we've honored for six decades as the gold standard in measuring a new treatment modality, absolutely confirms the reality that our beliefs, thoughts, and attitudes play a tremendous role in our healing and becoming more whole. So in other words, NDEs and this bigger expansion of conscious awareness in a scientific sense is opening the door to, to tremendous growth for each and every human being in a better influencing and modulating uh, their emerging reality, beginning with their health. Hmm. You talk about um, memories not coming or existing in the brain. So where, where do we store our memories? Well, to answer that, you really have to dive very deep because the, the bigger question is where is this physical reality that surrounds us? We're so used to thinking that we're physical beings living in a physical world of you know three dimensions of space and one of time, and that that is the, the ground of our existence. And yet quantum physics and the study of consciousness show us very clearly that that is not true. We're not so limited by this physical realm. Uh, and that in fact, we really have to postulate uh, a, a realm of pure information. I'll call it either the Akashic field or the quantum hologram. I've heard it referred to with both of those terms. They both have some validity. But in other words, there's an information field of all the possibilities of what humans might encounter in their lives. And that we have a free will to actually determine our pathway through that realm. But one of the deepest lessons of quantum physics is that you cannot think of that world out there independent of the observer as truly existing. In, in other words, every bit of the world out there, including that physical universe, is something that depends on, on the mental layer of the universe for its expression. So when you ask me where memories are stored, I would say they're in an information field uh, common throughout this universe that is probably best labeled the quantum hologram. But to continue to look at the physical universe and the physical brain as kind of the basis of our reality uh, is disproven by all the experiments of quantum physics and by all the evidence for non-local consciousness that emerges in the modern world of psychology, neuroscience, and parapsychology. For example, the reality of telepathy. Telepathy in twins is a beautiful example. That's been quite well demonstrated. Just read Guy Leon Playfair's book, twin telepathy, and it will open your eyes to a tremendous power that we all have for telepathic communication. Then there are things like precognition, that we can actually know the future. Uh, Daryl Bim's exciting work out of, out of New York, and we talk about that a lot in Living in a Mindful Universe. Uh, but uh, the fact is, uh, scientifically, statistically, you can show that people can actually sense the future. In fact, their autonomic nervous system knows a few seconds into the future what is going to happen. And uh, that's work that Dean Radin at the Institute of Noetic Sciences has done. And then you have a tremendous amount of other evidence, a distance healing that's been uh, established scientifically, uh, power of prayer, um, psychokinesis, the mind over matter, uh, where people can actually manipulate physical matter with uh, their mind. These are all things that have been scientifically studied. Uh, to cut to the chase, just send your uh, listeners to uvadops.org, University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies.org. Uh, and you'll find a wealth of scientific information supporting everything that I'm talking about and much more. And of course, Living in a Mindful Universe is a book that does all of that and has a very extensive set of references. People can also go to ebenalexander.com. I have an extensive reading list with more than 100 uh, books, chapters, papers, many with live links that take you right to the actual documents, uh, all of it categorized. This, the, the data is in. It's the scientific world 
uh, to the extent that they haven't done their homework, might claim that near-death experiences in the afterlife are not there. But when you do your homework and go through the scientific data, you realize that all that this really does exist. And this is where the scientific community is headed on the nature of reality. So when you talk about consciousness, when you had your NDA, you were, you went, your body was here. And so was it your consciousness that went on for lack of a better term? And how are we connected through, you know, through our own consciousness to each other? If our memories are stored in this memory bank and they're all stored together, then there has to be a connection between all of us. Right. And I, I, the best way to look at it is that our souls seem to have a thread, a thread of existence. And that so in other words, our awareness, our sense of awareness uh, exists. Now it exists as a soul that actually extends before birth and beyond death. Uh, but that you know, is something we work our way into with a further discussion of all the evidence and data. Uh, but, the, but the reality is uh, we do have kind of a soul line that accumulates information. Now an important point is that that soul line, that awareness of existence and awareness of memory and uh, kind of that ongoing uh, sense of self in a, in a kind of a here now, but in a bigger sense, that's not necessarily stuck in a here now in this physical realm, in this physical body. But in other words, there is a thread that we can call self, higher soul, what have you, that exists from lifetime to lifetime, but we do not have ready access to the memories. There is... A, a process of what I call programmed forgetting. Just like, for example, we know that dreams are very important. Dreams and sleep are critical. If you're unable to dream and sleep for a few weeks, it can actually threaten your life. Uh, so dreams and sleep are critical. They're not just important to humans. We know going way down the evolutionary chain that many animals seem to sleep. Uh, and in fact, you can demonstrate dreamlike behavior that can emerge in certain settings and animals. So we know that's a pretty universal process. And yet most of us do not necessarily remember our dreams fully. We come back to this life and unless we're really good at writing down dreams and being aware of them and all that, the dream material can rapidly vanish uh, if you don't make efforts to record it. Now, why is that, that dreams would be so important? We know that they're crucial for our life. We don't even know what purpose they actually serve. Um, but the reality is that's what we face, is a situation where something so important as dreams uh, are not necessarily remembered for their content. Likewise, uh, if you go to UVA, uvadops.org, start researching the scientific data on uh, past life memories in children suggestive of reincarnation, and in their database they have more than 2,500 cases over the last six decades of children with these past life memories. But it's Dr. Jim Tucker who heads up that research now will tell you um, that you, you must be asking the children about these memories by age five or six, because after that, there are natural processes that cover over the memories. Now, they can be recovered later in life. You could have an NDE that would allow you to recover memories uh, of, of a past life or between lives. You can do it through hypnotic regression. You can do it through meditation. That's something that Karen and I excel in teaching workshops. Uh, for people using sacred acoustics. Sacred acoustics is a very powerful form of brainwave entrainment that allows people to get into deep states of meditative awareness. All of these are techniques where you can start to recover those memories and start to uh, realize that, yes, you've had uh, memories in past lives uh, that contribute to your life here. And I would say that the whole world of transpersonal psychology, say beginning with the work of Carl Jung and then uh, people like Charlie Tart. Stan Groff, Michael Newton, uh, Brian Weiss, these are brilliant clinical investigators who came to realize uh, that only by acknowledging past life memories and their role in, in their patients could they best explain the, the psychological issues they're facing in this life. Uh, so this is just giving us a much bigger theater of operations for consciousness and our understanding of it, but it also has tremendous benefits for our healing and understanding of our own existence when we realize that we've been here before, uh, we have other kind of karmic issues that were raised in, in past lives, and that all figures into the issues we face in this life. And the more we can know about all of that, uh, the more we can come to live these lives most fully. But that whole world of transpersonal psychology is a very practical, 
uh, arm of hundreds of thousands of people who have benefited from these techniques over the last few uh, decades or half century. What I find so interesting, um, as a hypnotherapist, and I have regressed hundreds of thousands, I don't even know how many people, um, there is an element of personality that goes on through lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. And the healing, once you're able to understand why, you know, you have certain aspects of your personality or certain things bother you, um, is, is, is unbelievable. Also, another great book, um, and I think Ian Stevenson was affiliated um, with the University of Virginia. He wrote a book called Old Souls. Yes, Ian Stevenson yeah. started all that work amazing. in division of perceptual studies. An amazing, amazing, amazing book. Um, so, you know, the listeners want to pick up yet another book. Um, this, uh, these are really um, interesting reads. Were you spiritual before you had the NDE, and are you spiritual now? Well, I would say I was very influenced by my father, who was an academic neurosurgeon. He ran a neurosurgical training program, but he had also been a uh, combat surgeon in the Second World War. Uh, his own father was a general surgeon in eastern Tennessee who had raised him in the Presbyterian Church there. And I do believe it was my father's very strong belief in a loving personal God and the power of prayer that got him through World War II relatively unscathed. Uh, and then I, I, he modeled for me this uh, beautiful example of a scientist who was very well read in modern cosmology and every bit of that, who also fully believed uh, in, in God. And he, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, kind of a modern church setting, uh, we went to a Methodist church growing up. But I was challenged by that my whole life. I realized early on that science is the pathway to truth. I'm more of a scientist today than I've ever been. And I promise you, this is a profound kind of scientific truth uh, emerging about our spiritual nature and the spiritual nature of the universe. Um, but I struggled with it for many years, uh, especially I'd say in the uh, 80s and 90s, I was having trouble understanding how any kind of conscious awareness could survive the death of the brain and body. Um, and then I went through a very dark night of the soul. This is all explained in Proof of Heaven. Uh, but I was adopted. That's part of my backstory. That actually is a very important part to get into details of my big journey before and after my coma. But my adoption, uh, I was put up for adoption at age 11 days, uh, and that uh, figured into my life. I explained a lot of that in Proof of Heaven, expand on it in Living in a Mindful Universe. But the bottom line is I had uh, come to accept that my birth mother had left me behind at age 11 days, and just that was okay. Uh, I went through the normal process of adoptees looking for my birth mother back in my 20s. She was nowhere to be found. The children's home said, give up on it. You know, she's not looking for you, so forget about it. So I forgot about it. And that was until my oldest son, Evan IV, had a school project in the year 2000, uh, where he was supposed to find out more about his, uh, his heritage, his biological heritage. So he said, Dad, you've got to write a letter to the children's home and get better answers. We need to know more. So I wrote that letter, and in February of 2000, I got a response back. Again, all this is there in proof of heaven, but the reality is it was a perceived rejection from my birth mother. I found out my birth mother was out there. Not only that, but she'd married my birth father. That had never been something I thought possible, and also they had three children. So I had a whole biological family out there, and yet the message from the... Uh, social worker, that February 2000 phone call was, but it's not a good time to come back in their lives. And uh, so that sent me into a dark night of the soul. I didn't realize till months later, I stopped taking my sons to church. I stopped saying prayers to them at night. And that dark night of the soul lasted eight years right up to my coma. Now it turns out it was a year before my coma that for other reasons, I ended up writing another letter to the children's home to meet my birth family. On October 5th, 2007, I walked down a sidewalk in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and met them for the first time in 54 years, hugged my mother, uh, minutes later hugged my birth father, and over that weekend met brother and sister and then extended family, etc. Been a wonderful experience throughout, except a, a little bittersweet because they had lost that daughter, Betsy. Uh, in fact, it was because of Betsy's loss that they were even communicating with the children's home beginning in, in uh, uh, 2000 that allowed me to reconnect with them. 
But the bottom line is uh, I kind of struggle with that uh, dark night of the soul, that perceived rejection from my birth mother, uh, told me there was no, no God. That's why I rejected him for eight years up until my coma. But everything changed dramatically with the coma. Yes, I'm deeply, profoundly spiritual. That will never change because my scientific side knows you cannot explain human spirit and the events of human lives without understanding we're spiritual beings connected in the spiritual universe. And that ultimately, those deep and profound lessons emerging about the nature of consciousness from a scientific perspective now all really point to one mind that we're all in this together. We're, we're sharing consciousness, that God force. Uh, and that's where this world needs to shift because we keep treating each other as if we're separate and as, we have, as if we have no responsibility to each other. And yet the deepest message from all the modern neuroscience of consciousness is we're all in this together bound through love and we need to manifest love, kindness, compassion, acceptance and mercy for ourselves and for all fellow beings. That is the absolute rule coming down from the new uh, science of consciousness with the NDEs as the tip of the spear. So who is God to you? What is God to you? What did you experience that leads you to who God may be? I think God is a force of infinite kind of love, a creation, and wholeness uh, at the very core of the universe. That's what, <coughs> excuse me, that's what. Uh, near-death experiencers for thousands of years across all belief systems have encountered and reported. That's what uh, they come back to this world uh, uh, to share. That's why they come back and have no fear of death because they realize uh, that uh, that God force is ultimately at the very core of our awareness. So we're not even separate from it. That's one of the myths that emerges in people trying to share these stories as opposed to people who have lived it. Uh, who realize that that uh, connection with God is very natural. Uh, you know, as I said, in Proof of Heaven, it's very personal. And in fact, it, it leads us to feel like we're really home. When we feel that connection, we realize, oh, th this is our true home, this connection. But that God force, I would say, is the very core of our conscious awareness. In fact, it's what, in many ways, uh, proves to us that uh, it's not as if there's a battle between good and evil out there. Uh, in fact, the, the force in the universe is one of love and light, that God force, and yet it's not distributed throughout this world, and it's that gradient. So there is an, an absence of that God force. That's what we perceive as illness uh, or, or as uh, evil and apparent darkness. Uh, is just the lack of that light and love. And that's why it's important to understand that we all have the ability by having that connection with that pure loving awareness at the core of the universe, that God force, we can all serve to bring that in to this universe by first of all, acknowledging that that is right at the core of our awareness through direct experience, which we can all do through meditation, centering prayer, what have you. Um, but also uh, through uh, that process of, of going within and cultivating that relationship through meditation uh, and, and the various ways that we can go within and explore that primordial mind. Because the modern scientific hypothesis is the brain is a reducing valve or filter <clears throat> that allows us to connect with that primordial mind, but it filters consciousness into us in a way that seems like a sense of self and a sense of here and now. And yet the life review that is so commonly encountered by near-death experiencers is a beautiful example of how the boundaries of self in many ways are false. Because in a life review, you often experience the big events of your life that still have residual lessons to teach from the emotional perspective of those who were affected by your actions and even thoughts around you. That's what the life review is. You don't experience it as your perspective so much as from the perspective of all involved. And it's a beautiful example of how the golden rule, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated, in many ways is written into the fabric of the universe through this life review. And the life review is not a new age concept. Go back to the writings of Plato 2,400 years ago. He wrote about Armenian soldier Ur killed in battle who had a profound life review where he realized the only important thing in this world is how much love you brought to the world. And that's said by, by an Armenian soldier killed in battle 2,400 years ago. It could happen to a, a, a soldier in Iraq or Afghanistan today, the very same events, 
and uh, of that life review would have the same beautiful lessons of connection, oneness, love, and oneness with the divine, which is an important lesson for all of us to remember in living our lives. So what happens if you're somebody like Hitler and the people that you hurt like are still living or indirectly you've, you've the people that you hurt is he still looking at his life review well still looking at implies that he oh, is scary. limited by earth time life reviews do not happen in earth time that's why they're so absolutely complete and real they're not vague sepia tinted memories they're sharp crisp ultra real reliving re-experiencing of those events so in other words, uh, that's why people can have an absolutely complete life review, even if their heart attack only lasted for a few minutes and bam, that was you know the time they had to go through this NDE. But NDEs are not limited by earth time. Uh, you know, that realm has eternity and infinity available to it. And that's why there's a tremendous amount more possible. But to get to your question, of, uh, you know, essentially all of the wrong we've ever done to others is part of our sole mission is to understand the wrongs and the rights, all of it. And that's why a life of view in many ways can be viewed as neutral. But given that most of us would rather be on the receiving end of love and compassion and kindness, a life of view for somebody who's handed out a lot of pain and suffering like Hitler could be a very terrible thing to go through because he has to feel every bit of the pain and torment that happened to all the people involved in that. There were 50 some million people killed in World War II. Um, and every bit of that was Hitler's responsibility. So yes, he goes through it. You, you can guess how long it takes to go through that. Uh, not only that, but all of the other souls that have ever existed since World War II who knew of that, mm -hmm. uh, who had relatives who lived through it. Hitler's uh, soul has to enter dance with every single one of them. Um, you know, it's just, it's the, the realization here is that the choices we make in life matter. That gets reflected in this life review uh, where we realize that, that uh, none of it was accidental or chaotic. Um, and, and we really do have a deep responsibility. I think that's one of the biggest blessings uh, that comes out of this modern neuroscience of consciousness is we realize that we have a responsibility. You know, there certainly are features, say, in, in materialist science that tries to pretend that if it's just the brain producing consciousness out of chemical reactions and electron fluxes, they take away the notion of free will. Because if it's just chemical reactions and electron fluxes and the material in, inside my head following the laws of physics, chemistry, biology, then, you know, who are we, uh, you know, putting through a trial if, if I've done something wrong or uh, put in prison? Whereas materialist science would be very proudly telling you nobody has free will. But in some ways, you could argue that uh, some in Christianity believe that if they believe in Christ, then that's, all the, that's the end of their responsibility. But I would say, no, the message is much deeper, that we have a true responsibility for our actions and thoughts. Uh, we need to live that life uh, more fully that reflects that uh, uh, you know, what we give out to others, we should expect back from the universe. And we will reap all of that when we go through our life review. Uh, so better to get it settled here and now. Uh, Karen often talks about the day review. Uh, and she's taught me about a lot of principles of kind of going through the making amends with others. You, you know, when you hit the end of your physical life, hopefully you've got rid of all those things, made amends to people, shared love, kindness, compassion with all involved. Uh, and anybody that you ever hurt uh, or handed out pain or suffering to, somehow you've, uh, you've uh, uh, sought amends, you know, forgiven where necessary. All of these are beautiful and powerful steps towards uh, kind of a deeper understanding of our responsibilities as uh, souls that are connected to this God force. So you talk about free will as a human being. What about free will as a soul? Does the soul have free will? Well, yes, I would say, in fact, uh, from my point of view, our ultimate true free will is that of the soul and higher soul. And that is said in very much in contradistinction to what some might call the will of their ego. The ego serves a useful purpose. You know, it's here to kind of, uh, in this dance of predator and prey, the sense of an ego is there to kind of protect the sense I have of being in this body 
and protecting this body from uh, uh, whatever threats. But it turns out in our modern world, certain in hu humanity dealing with uh, humans, dealing with humans and with other uh, animals, etc. You know, the ego mind is very limiting and it is a false sense of self. Uh, and so in many ways, a lot of what we're talking about is achieving that kind of free will of the higher soul. And that is something Karen and I often teach through meditation, centering prayer. These are ways of kind of getting in touch with the higher soul. But the higher soul is always achieving those goals through win-win situations, through taking the higher good for all involved as being the ultimate good that that higher soul is seeking and not a kind of an egotistical, self-centered, kind of childish, immature, uh, wanting for things for me, 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 that kind of thing. Uh, that free will is not really a free will at all. That is an example of kind of the automatonic behavior that humans can often uh, kind of descend into when they're very self-focused uh, and very immature souls, so uh, just kind of put it in perspective. Uh, in fact, I would say a, a litmus test for how advanced the soul is in terms of how many incarnations they may have been through and how advanced their knowledge is would have to do with how focused they are on the higher good and the good of all involved, as opposed to a very early immature soul that is very egocentric and self-focused, narcissistic, uh, that kind of thing. That would be a soul that's very new to the game, uh, just beginning to learn any of the rules. But I would say most of us are better off pursuing the free will of our higher soul, uh, which is absolutely one that we can encounter in deep prayer and meditation, uh, and that we can bring back to this world and learn that the greatest uh, kind of gift of loving self is manifested by serving as a conduit for that love, that higher love of primordial mind and kind of a heart-based consciousness to share that love with the rest of this world through kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance. And again, when necessary, forgiveness, and never forget the importance of gratitude. So this is a very philosophical question, but that's been asked over the ages. Why are we here? Why can't we I just think to, all be in heaven? I would say the reason if, if uh, I, I've heard that the written over the entrance to the temple of the Oracle at Delphi are the words, know thyself. I would say that's exactly why we're here. But do be advised that thyself includes the entire universe with which you relate. So know thyself is a very deep and profound challenge to any sentient being that has ever or will ever exist to more fully know their relationship with the oneness of the universe. And that involves all of their interactions, all of their kind of thoughts and beliefs about their uh, interrelationships about their very existence, about their purpose, any meaning that might exist for them and for their soul group and for this universe at large is all something that comes from this edict to know yourself. But uh, we're talking about that in a very deep and profound sense, especially with the modern expansion of the science of consciousness and quantum physics that in many ways shows that each and every one of us has this beautiful one-to-one -one correlation with the mind of the universe. Well, that could be your next book. Yes, that's what I'm working on. <laughs> there you go. Um, you talk in your book about meeting your sister. Am I correct? Yes. Um, so you, you met her during your NDA and uh, maybe you can describe that. And do you communicate with her since you've come back from that? Absolutely. Well, that's, that's one of the most beautiful parts of the book. And in fact, that was the part that to me absolutely proved the reality of the journey. Now that entire argument and story is all told in proof of heaven. And uh, so a spoiler alert, I'm gonna share a teeny bit of that here, but there's a tremendous amount more to that story that I'm not gonna share right now, but is uh, absolutely part of Proof of Heaven and is expanded on in the book, Living in a Mind for the Universe. Uh, but it has to do with that beautiful young woman on the butterfly wing. Now, if I had scripted my NDE, first and foremost, my father would have been there. He had passed over four years before my coma. He was that academic neurosurgeon I talked about a little while ago, who was very spiritual, but also very scientific. And uh, again, if I had written all this out the way I wanted it to unfold, my dad would have been there. He was nowhere to be found in the NDE. Now, in months after, uh, it came to me the realization that uh, 
there was a reason why this beautiful young woman was there. Now, when I first came back to this world, I remembered her as perfectly as I remembered all the other uh, kind of beings and entities I encountered in this journey, including the six faces I saw on the way out. And the interesting thing is I knew her so well from that journey on the butterfly wing where she accompanied me time after time. Every time I'd ascend back through that layer of the journey, there she was, this beautiful smiling presence, always the same message. You're deeply loved and cherished. You have nothing to fear. You will be taken care of. And that smile and look of pure love. And so I knew her deeply, uh, more deeply than, than I've ever known anybody in this realm. And yet I had no idea who she was. Uh, and that was the big mystery. That was the challenge to me to come to a deeper understanding. And that's why when people read Proof of Heaven, they'll realize that that reuni reunion with my birth family, that had happened a year before my coma uh, and was still ongoing, my ongoing relationship and, and uh, meeting up with them and learning more about the family. And I remember my one sister, Kathy, promised to one day send me a picture of Betsy, the sister who had died in 1998, two years before I even know of her existence. And that is the picture that arrived in the mail about four months after my coma. And I'll never forget, I looked at that picture and I just collapsed on the floor. Again, all this part of the story is at the end of Proof of Heaven. Uh, and I remember putting it up on my dresser and I was so overwhelmed with emotion about the tragedy of loss of this beautiful sister who I never got to know that I didn't even know about until years after she had left the physical plane. And it was the next morning when I was sitting in that room reading a book by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, about life after death, and a beautiful story in there about a, 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 a teenage girl who had a profound near-death experience where she was welcomed to the heavenly realms by her brother. Uh, and uh, he helped her go through that entire process of knowing that this beautiful heavenly realm is real, but then making the decision whether or not to go back to her earthly body to live through that life and uh, rejoin her teenage body to do all that, or to stay in that heavenly realm and go into her next incarnation. And she came back to this world. But she, when she was talking it over with her father, she said, but I don't understand. I don't have a brother. And he said, well, you did have a brother, but the brother died three months before you were born. So we never told you about it. And that's when I looked up on my dress at that picture I just got in the afternoon before. Oh my God. And she's looking at me with a smile like, do you finally get it? And I do finally get it, Betsy. It finally sank in. And that, uh, it, it still sends chills up and down my spine to remember that beautiful kind of moment of recognition. But it was so shocking because all of a sudden the dots are connected to the deepest aspects of my spiritual journey all the way out uh, to getting this picture four months later when I'm putting all the details together, trying to figure it all out. And there comes the big message that it was your birth sister who you never knew. That was your loving guardian angel. Uh, and often when I tell that story, and I've told that story hundreds of times in public, and I still uh, often burst into tears, you know, my eyes missed up because it's so beautiful. And I used to think that's because it's a beautiful memory. But when I started giving that talk uh, telling that story in fr front of groups of hundreds of near-death experiencers, many of whom have this incredibly open ability to see spirit and all of that since their NDE, they would describe this 12-foot high uh, 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 angel of gold standing behind me. Other people would take pictures of me up on the podium uh, giving this talk, and there would be big orbs of purple light nearby that I think were associated with her spirit. And it became clear to me that I feel so emotional about it because she's still here. Uh, I don't see her. I don't see that energy except in deep meditation, but others can, and I can certainly feel her presence. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful. And I've developed, to answer, further answer your question, developed a far more <clears throat> a kind of robust uh, working relationship with her over time through meditation, both she and my father's soul. Uh, I explained in Living in a Mindful Universe about encountering my father's soul. Uh, two and a half years after my NDE, through meditation, through using sacred acoustics, uh, binaural beat brainwave entrainment uh, meditation, which again is something we explain a lot about in Living in a Mindful Universe. And for any of your audience who want to learn more about these deep meditative techniques, I would recommend go to sacredacoustics.com and you can learn a tremendous amount about ways to do this yourself. Yeah, and we're also having you back on with Karen in January so that's excellent uh, well i'm looking forward that, to that 
Yeah. So that, cause this, it would have been, we would have been sitting here talking for three hours, which I could right. do in a heartbeat with you. Um, so you went through this, this, this cataclysmic, wonderful um, experience that has changed your life. And has it also changed the life of your family? I would say it changed all of us and a lot of extended family and friends uh, had a tremendous impact. Um, my sons, for example, uh, both have uh, quite an interest in uh, the work that Karen and I do in sacred acoustics and vinyl or beat brainwave entrainment. Uh, for example, my older son, Evan IV, uh, in medical school, he listened to sacred acoustics theta tones while he was studying for his medical boards uh, because theta tones can be very powerful to enhance our mind's ability to function efficiently with memory and uh, study and things like that. And he feels like uh, several hundred hours of listening to theta uh, greatly improved his percentile performance on the medical board exams. Um, I know my younger son, Bond, we actually write about some of his experiences with sacred acoustics in the book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Uh, for example, when we were out visiting our friends, uh, Gary Zukov uh, and his wife, Linda, out in, in Oregon, while I was out there giving talks, Karen and I were there with Bond, uh, with my younger son, and Bond had uh, a profound meditative experience while at Gary's house, where he basically had a lucid dream where he was able to see the future in terms of other uh, properties uh, that were there on, on Zukov's uh, property uh, before he saw them physically. Uh, but there's a lot more of that in the book. But in other words, both of my sons have had experiences uh, in meditation and using sacred acoustics that show them the power of all of this. And I'd say their belief in prayer, their kind of knowledge of this bigger vision uh, that's come out of my awareness uh, is, is a tremendous part of our growth overall as a family. You talk about hearing music during your NDE. Do you remember what the music was? And, um, and was it, can you compare it to OM? Like, did you hear that as well? Or was it just a musical piece? Well, I would say OM is probably the, the part of it all that to me is deeply, most powerfully reflected in my experience. I would say the other music, like the melody that ushered me up from the earth where my view into the Gateway Valley, or those beautiful angelic choirs that served as a mus musical and light portal up into the core realm, uh, that music is uh, basically the music of the world of ideals, of those spiritual realms that is far too kind of perfect in its form to ever be uh, condensed into a music that you would hear in this material world. Uh, but the Aum sound, that's what I call that God force, because it was the only way for me to really label that. When I came back to this world, the God force that I encountered, that pure infinitely loving uh, force of God at the core of the universe was far too grand, powerful, and uh, uh, all-knowing and all-loving uh, for the word God to even work. So to me, the word God uh, was a puny little human word that really didn't do justice. And I also came to realize that God, Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, I don't care what words you use, they're all just very confusing. You know, Rene Descartes said, to define is to limit. And for something as limitless, eternal, and infinite as that God force, to put a label on it just really just flat out does not work. Uh, for me, that's why I used Aum, because Aum was the sound that I remembered from that core realm. Um, when people would ask what was the origin of that Aum, I said, well, I guess it's the resonance you would expect in the infinite cavity uh, over an eternal uh, uh, time span. That, that form of resonance was that alm sense that I brought back. But the, uh, the actual uh, sounds of those other, uh, the other music I heard, I do not believe can be so simply described in anything that we're used to in this four dimensional space time. You know, it's so interesting as you're, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, you know, when, when, when Moses was speaking to God and said, I have to go back and call you something to these people. And God said, tell them I am that I am. So right. I have this consistency, you know, and I think it, it is. does represent that because it's a vibration and it's consistent and it doesn't matter what you call it, you know? Yes. Um, and so well, better to experience it than to yeah. label it. And, yeah. and that's why we are giant proponents of, of uh, meditation.
meditation, of centering prayer, of going within, because as we go within and realize that the brain is not creating this teeny little personal mind, but that mind is far more expansive and in fact the entire universe throughout all of eternity is contained within that primordial mind that we have access to. Uh, this is what spiritual teachers, uh, going back to time immemorial, have discussed. It's a reality that's coming into view as we elaborate these techniques of deep meditative uh, uh, experience and personal journeying. The answers lie within us all. This is all about coming in touch with that profound and healing force of love that connects us with the universe at large. So are you afraid to ultimately die? I'm sorry, what was that? Are you afraid to ultimately leave your body and die? No, no. Death, I mean, it's not something I'm rushing toward because I feel like I have other things to do, but death is a tremendous adventure. Uh, it's, it's not like going dim to nothing, which is what I thought it was before my coma. Um, and that's what, of course, what the materialist scientific model would tell you is your uh, awareness dims down to zero, to, to absent blackness. Well, that's not what NDEers tell us, and they're out there by the millions. Uh, and then when you combine their stories with all the other evidence as we do in Living in a Mindful Universe for the bigger theater of consciousness, you realize your brain is a prison. This is the shackles that uh, imprison us. Meditation, centering prayer, these are all ways for us to expand and be liberated from those shackles. Um, you know, in Tibetan dream work, you spend your life doing kind of uh, developing practices of lucid dreaming so that when your body dies, you're very comfortable with this notion of a facile free spirit because that's what happened. You get liberated. You know, our culture, unfortunately, uh, in trying to teach so many people uh, not to expect anything, they're kind of unprepared for what happens. That's why this, this world of consciousness studies, uh, expanding on the uh, message of near-death experiences and especially of the bigger message of consciousness from a modern scientific perspective that allows for reincarnation, allows for, re, uh, for, for the afterlife and every bit of what we're talking about, uh, then that can be very, very liberating, especially when we learn uh, that we're eternal souls and we can know that long before we leave the physical body at the time of bodily death. Well, I'm glad you're not gonna die soon. Um, but So what do you have in store for us? Like what is in store for you going into the future? Well, really, my interest remains very deeply and profoundly a neuroscientist wanting to answer the mind-brain uh, connection and come up with a far deeper understanding of it all. And uh, that's what I'll keep working on as long as I can. I mean, uh, I had that mission before my coma, but I didn't realize how profound a mission it was, how big and broad a mission. Uh, I used to think it was confined into the tiny little mind of a physicalist thinking that only the physical world exists. And now I realize my mind is far, far greater than that. And it's really all about uh, kind of helping this world because these are very deep truths. Our world is in trouble. Our materialist thinking, the materialist scientific world and its false sense of separation has led us into some very dark territory. Um, you know, the economic polarization with all the wealth uh, accumulated at the very tip top of the pile with the bottom 40% or so of our uh, uh, economy not really sharing in the gifts of the economy. Um, our healthcare system of so much about our kind of spiritual awareness or lack thereof needs tremendous growth. So this uh, revolution and awakening about uh, the nature of human consciousness, I think is absolutely essential for the survival, not only of, of homo sapiens and humanity on this planet, but really for the planet at large because of climate change and so many of the ways uh, like with plastic pollution, that we threaten so many other species with extinction. It really is time for Homo sapiens. You know, sapiens means wise. Well, I would like to see a little bit more wisdom coming out of, uh, uh, out of humanity. And I believe that's what this awakening is all about. And I believe that uh, the, when the science of consciousness works its way through our uh, worldview over the next few decades, that we will find this world is a far gentler, uh, more harmonious, more prosperous, and more loving and kind environment for all beings. And that is an absolutely critical mission uh, as far as I'm concerned. So if that's all I do for the rest of my life is focus on trying to bring that change in this world, I think uh, I'll feel okay with that. Well, on behalf of me, 
and everyone who's listening out there and the world at large, thank you very much for bringing that to us. For people who wanna reach out to us, so I've mentioned several websites, but also unitedinhopeandhealing.com is a very uh, key place to get into a lot of the free offerings we have and other offerings into a mental health practitioner course. That's something we can talk about more in the uh, January talk when Karen's here because it was sacred acoustics and all of her work uh, that resulted in that beautiful pilot study by Dr. Anna Usum uh, in the Journal of uh, Nervous and Mental Diseases, February 2020. But we can talk about all that next time. And Anna will also be on with you. Excellent. Well, that will be perfect. Love I love Anna. Yeah. And uh, between uh, Anna and Karen, I don't think I could be in a better place. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, and to all my listeners, I, I know that you've had to enjoy today's episode. Um, and if you did, please like, share, and comment. And be sure to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. And thank you so much for coming on today. Anna, thank you so much for having me. Great talking with you. And we'll talk again soon. Yes, we will. Thanks. Bye-bye now.